This is Wake Up Carolina on a Thursday morning. 843-661-0937 is our number. We spent a good bit of the morning talking about the the Senate vote yesterday on gun control. Um, I always go to Reason. Reason.com is a very libertarian-leaning website. It's not conservative. It's not liberal. It's libertarian. And I'm talking about it's unapologetically libertarian. And whoa, I mean, their take on this gun control legislation is, as you would imagine, libertarians to believe. And we'll kind of, we got all day tomorrow. Uh, we'll have Philip and Jay and, and Mike with us tomorrow. So we'll kind of discuss uh, probably ad nauseum some of those things, some of those issues that um, that we're still trying to grapple with and understand it's 80 pages. Um, a lot of this is, I mean, some of this is mental health and um, school safety and security. It's kind of interesting. Um, they've increased funding and there'll be a big debate about, you know, what do we need to do uh, as it relates to gun control and keeping schools safe? Because the impetus for this legislation is Uvalde and the horrific school shooting that breaks all of our heart, no matter where you stand on the Second Amendment or politics in general. And I just think it's kind of interesting, Rev, that we have this gun legislation. Part of the legislation is school safety. And we've got, you know, in consecutive days, not consecutive, I think Ella was here Tuesday and Kathy Manus is with us this morning. She is was the uh, is was the leading vote getter in round one of the superintendent of education's race in South Carolina. I said it, and I'll say it again. Um, because of our weak governor, and Henry doesn't like to hear that, but it is what it is. Uh, we live in a very, very legislatively dominated state. Um, the and you're talking of, about the structure of the, the government, structure not, of not the, government, not the person. No, but, no, Henry's plenty strong. I mean, I don't want to. I don't <laughs> want to offend my good friend McMahon. No, but but in all seriousness. Um, the governor of South Carolina has a, a little executive authority, but not anywhere near as much as they would in some of the other states. The superintendent of education, I've argued um, pretty much all of my political life, is the most important election South Carolinians participate in statewide. I really believe that. Um, I know the governor has the mansion and the state house and all these other sorts of things, but, but I still believe from a practical policy perspective – um, steering a, an organization like public education in a particular direction or other is of enormous consequence, and it needs to be taken very seriously. And we have with us Kathy Manus, once again, the leading vote getter in the Republican primary. So, Kathy, good morning. Thank to begin you, with. Ken. How are you? I'm so glad to be here this morning. We're glad to have you here. I will let you, before we get into questions and, and let you give some answers, I'll let you introduce yourself to our listeners, who you are, where you're from, what you believe in. Thank you. Well, I am Kathy Manus, and I'm a lifetime educator. I'm a former third grade teacher in Lancaster County, where we had the Springs Industries, the textiles where I grew up, uh, where my daddy worked as an accountant, um, and that's not there anymore. So that part of Lancaster, just like what you just talked about, has um, has kind of gone away. Um, but I, I was very fortunate to teach third grade at Irwin Elementary in Lancaster after I graduated from the University of South Carolina with my Bachelor's of Arts in Elementary Education. And then while I was teaching, I earned my Master's in Early Childhood Education and then went at USC and then went on to Winthrop where I received the Certification in Education Administration. Um, and the part about earned... Uh, is very important to me because in 2018, and you'll remember this, the General Assembly changed the law. Um, Actually, the first part of the law was the constitutional amendment for the people of South Carolina to vote whether this um, position continued to be elected or if it was appointed by the governor. And I think you like the part about it being appointed by the governor. But 60% of South Carolinians voted to keep it elected. So, so we're still doing this in an election. Um, but the second part of that bill dealt with the qualifications for this office. And one qualification is that you have to have a master's degree. And so that's why I'm very proud that I have earned my master's in early childhood education. My opponent does not meet the qualifications of the law. Um, and so I'm the only qualified candidate on the ballot on Tuesday. Um, So after I was teaching and while I was teaching, I was the president of Palmetto State Teachers Association. And now I am serve as the executive director. And let me tell you about Palmetto State Teachers Association. Many people, especially teachers, know us as PSTA. We were formed in 1976 
so that teachers could belong to a professional association without being affiliated with the union. So this stuff about me being a union lobbyist, that is so wrong. I am against unions in education, especially in South Carolina. So before 1976, teachers in South Carolina could belong to their local education association, like the Florence County Education Association, or they could belong to the State Education Association, the South Carolina Education Association, or they could belong to the National Education Association, the NEA, the largest union in the country. So they could belong to one of those or two of those or all three of those. And then our State Education Association, the SCEA, unified with the NEA. And in order to belong to your Florence County Education Association or the South Carolina Education Association, you had to join the union. You were forced to join the union. And there were teachers in South Carolina who did not have the beliefs of the union. And so we were formed to give those teachers a choice. And we were very fortunate that we are the largest professional association for teachers in South Carolina, not affiliated with the union at all. So when you see that, that is just wrong. That is is, uh, misinformation there. Fake news is, I think, the new moniker in, like in America. Fake politics. news. We I got mean, a lot of fake news going on with yeah, this yeah, kid. Yes, it's, it's, well, I mean, welcome to politics. And so, <laughs> it's a rough and tumble game. You know that, having been around it a bit. I want to get your take on this. Uh, the metrics and measures of which we, uh, well, you got basic and proficient and advanced and all these terminologies that are used in education. But by any measure, South Carolina seems to be underperforming in public education. As superintendent of education, how do you address? Do, do you believe the system is underperforming? And, and what are the deficiencies that have led to a, a consistent underperformance? We do have parts of South Carolina that our schools are underperforming. There is no doubt about that. We also have some good districts where our schools are doing well. But let me tell you some things that we need to do. As the next state superintendent of education, I want to make sure that every student that leaves our public schools are ready for the three E's, enrollment, enlistment, or employment. Not everybody should go to college. Not uh, Everybody's not meant to go to college. Should we normalize that? I hate to interrupt you, but I want to have a bit of it. Should we normalize, because it seems to me as a business person, that we've geared K through 12, the only success story for a student is to go to a four-year institution of higher learning. Should we normalize these alternative uh, avenues? We should make sure that children realize you don't have to go to college to be successful. Um, And in order for us to do that, we have to improve our career and technology uh, education. When I was going to school, we called it Lancaster Vocational School. Uh, We called it the trade school. But we have to do a better job of providing that kind of education for our students. We've got to strengthen our career programs. I was speaking to some of the school board members in Florence One, and they were talking about they wanted to do a military, I'm sorry, a medical magnet program, not just for Florence School District One, but for the whole region. Boy, do we need that now. We need to be able to train young people to go into the medical profession. That would be great. I heard somebody say, we don't have enough cosmetologists. So I remember that was huge at Lancaster Vocational School. People I graduated with, they're still uh, a cosmetologist and doing a good job of that. And so we have to make sure that we have apprenticeships available for our students. Um, People in welding, if they they, um, study welding, they come out making more money than first-year teachers. We got to have it. We got to have people who can work on our cars. Um, so we have to do a better job of making sure that we're preparing our students for the workforce. And also, if they decide that they want to go to Francis Marion University or to Coker or, or to Florence Darlington Tech, that we have provided them with the tools to be successful at their next step. And then if they're going to serve our country. We got to make sure they know the soft skills going in there. They're going to get it once they get in there. But the soft skills to be able to work with people, get to work on time, do all that. And so um, we got to make sure that our students are ready for the three E's. We also are in a teacher shortage crisis in South Carolina. Used to 
when I would uh, testify before the General Assembly, I would say we have a teacher shortage in math and science and foreign language and special education because we've always had that. But when we cannot find enough elementary and early childhood teachers, we are in a crisis in South Carolina. And that is something that we must do, recruit and retain our teachers. And I want to make sure that we get them in there. But once we get them in there, that we're keeping them. Teachers need more pay. There's no doubt about that. Uh, Starting salary in the state this year, thank you to the General Assembly for raising the starting salary, is $40,000. And so that was a great start, and I appreciate what the General Assembly did there. But there are other things we've got to do. These teachers need less paperwork. They are drowning in the amount of paperwork that they have to do daily. We also need less testing. I was at the um, at the Elton John concert. You know, I bought my tickets two years before COVID. We finally got to go to the Elton John concert, and I was holding up my sign. And this teacher came up to me, and she said, what are you going to do for teachers? And so I talked about it. She teaches in Anderson kindergarten. She says, I have to assess my kindergartners 38 times. That's ridiculous. So we got to look at all these tests that we're having to do, our students are having to do, and we need to get rid of some of them. And we must restore discipline in our classrooms so that our teachers can teach and our students can learn. No student should keep my son from learning. And no student should keep his teacher from teaching. And so we've got to reduce paperwork, reduce testing, and restore discipline so teachers can do what they are trained to do and what they love to do. And that's to teach. Kathy, as it relates to reform, you talked about some of the reform aspects of education. Um, School choice has been the center of the debate in the Republican Party, um, bringing competition into the marketplace of education. Conceptually, philosophically, where do you stand on school choice, vouchers, competition amongst education? I, I do support school choice. And um, and that's very important that parents have an opportunity to do what's best for their child. If they want to homeschool their child, then then that's great. In fact, one of my hardest working campaign uh, on this campaign is a homeschooled young man up in Greenville, and he is knocking it out up there. Um, so if 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 te- if um, parents would like to send their child to a private school, then that's good. And and we are are doing a good job. In our public schools with choice. Charter schools are great in most parts of South Carolina. I don't know if you've had a chance to see Liberty Steam Charter School in Sumter. They are knocking it out of the park. They have two adults in each classroom working with their small classes classes of children, and they're doing great things. So we've got wonderful charter schools. we got magnet schools just like Florence One wants to do that medical magnet school. That is great. Virtual school for some parents, that's a, a, a great opportunity for them. Now, it didn't work for my child, but for some parents, that is a choice that they want to make, and it works for them. Um, I loved the bill that Senator Loftus had this year on open enrollment, and I was hoping that that would pass. Unfortunately, it did not pass. That would allow students to go to any school in their district or in another district. Um, And so that is a great opportunity for school choice for our parents and for our students. So I hope that that would be able to pass next year. I I will work real hard um, as state superintendent of education to get that passed to offer our parents more choices. Okay, we're going to take our first break in the studio with us, Kathy Maness, Republican nominee for superintendent of education. We'll actually have a debate uh, tonight at uh, 7 o'clock, if I'm not mistaken, State Bridge Suites, uh, Kathy Maness, Ellen Weaver. Uh, the, I would say mano a mano, but these are two ladies um, hashing it out, duking it out, trying to win your support for superintendent of education. And I am honored to have both ladies in our studio. We'll take a break. We'll be back in just a minute. 843-661-0937 is our number. We've got about 30 more minutes with our Republican candidate for superintendent of education, um, Kathy Maness. We'll have a debate tonight at 7 o'clock when these two ladies can, um, I would imagine, in some way disagree with one another about what is best for the students and schools of South education system in South Carolina. I, I want to go to, we were talking when you got here about the um, 
the, the horrific shooting in Uvalde, Texas led to um, a debate, an eventual policy change. Uh, Republican voters in South Carolina don't much care for uh, monkeying around. Here I go with small talent, monkeying around <laughs> with the Second Amendment. But there's there, there's a part of this that enhances school safety and security. Um, there's some politicians in, in our party that believe teachers should be armed, not forced to be armed, but make a decision to be armed. Um, what does a, a school safety improvement look like under Superintendent of Kathy Manus, and does it include teachers potentially being armed on the campuses? So that is a great question, Ken. And I will tell you, I am an expert in education because that's been my whole life. I'm not an expert in school safety. So two weeks after I'm sworn in as our next state superintendent of education, I am bringing together sheriffs and police chiefs from all over South Carolina, from Charleston and Greenville to Timmonsville to Johnsonville, Lexington. We are all coming together, and we're going to talk about what school safety needs to look like in South Carolina. And and part of that, I'm sure, will be whether or not teachers, if they want to, should carry guns. But that's the advice that I will get from the experts. And, and if they decide, yes, Kathy, that's a great thing for us to do, then we'll pursue that. Again, teachers should only do that if they feel comfortable doing that if they're well-trained, but I will meet with this group because I don't ever want what happened in Texas to happen in South Carolina. And that is my number one thing that I'm going to do right after I'm sworn in is bring the, the experts together. And we're going to talk about school safety. We know a lot of this is dealing with mental health of our children. Uh, there's a couple of things that as state superintendent I need to do, and that is um, – to reduce our counselor to student ratio um, is too high right now. Counselors don't have the opportunity to get in with those students, and maybe we can find things early um, and and stop any a student or a former student who may be coming to do that. Um, we got to do that. We got to have more mental health counselors. We've got to have more school psychologists. Everyone in there working with our students to make sure they stay safe. Every student, teacher, and staff person in our schools must be safe. And that will be a number one priority for me early as I begin um, serving as our next state If a teacher chooses to take on that responsibility, should there be an increase in pay? Absolutely. Um, teachers, and that's what we're looking at at Palmetto State Teachers Association, and we've had a conversation with many members of the legislature. In fact, they put a proviso in the budget to look at our state salary, um, uh, what our state salary looks like. Right now, teachers are, be- are paid based on their number of years' experience and their education level, whether they have a bachelor's, 18 hours over that bachelor's, master's, master's plus 30, or an EDS for PhD. And so that's how they're paid. We need to make sure that when teachers are going above and beyond, that they're getting paid for that. And so uh, at our request... The General Assembly put in a uh, study of the state salary schedule. Uh, and so we want to look at that. If teachers are mentors, they need to be paid more. Uh, and we already have it thanks to Senator Tom Davis and Senator Leatherman uh, a couple of years ago reinstated the National Board Certification Supplement because we have so many teachers who say, I have to go into administration because I have to make more money. We want to make it where they can stay in our classroom and that our good teachers can make more money. So, okay. yes, we need to look at that salary Okay, schedule. you hit on a key word, good teachers. What do we do with the bad teachers? Well, well, what do we do with ones that underperform and for whatever reason don't educate kids as effectively as they should? Well, contrary to what many people in the public think, that you can't get rid of a bad teacher, you absolutely can get rid of a bad teacher. Um, we have um, an evaluation system called ADEPT. And uh, that is a statewide evaluation system that's used to evaluate teachers. And if they are not performing like they should perform, then then they will um, they will not recommend that their contract be removed. Now, if we have the bad teacher, we need to bring that teacher in. And the law says you have to do this. If you're not going to renew a contract of a teacher, you bring that teacher in, 
You make sure that they know what their deficiencies are, what they're having trouble with, and give them an opportunity to improve. And so that's what we need to do. Administrators need to do the evaluation system and do it correctly so that they can document that teachers are not performing. I don't want bad teachers in a classroom. I would never want for one of my children to have a bad teacher. And so there are there are ways in South Carolina to get rid of a bad teacher. Is there should there be a revisiting of the evaluation administration? In other words, when when I got to county council, I realized there was a metric pay in or excuse me, a merit pay in place, but but we weren't we weren't accounting for that. We weren't evaluating as we should have. Um, I, I think that the public believes we can get rid of a bad teacher. It's just too complicated. It's too cumbersome. It's too um, litigious. Should we revisit, streamline, make more efficient, effective uh, the, the, the evaluation administrating process? If the administrator does it correctly, it is not hard to get rid of Who holds the administrator responsible? The holds- superintendent and the school board okay. and the parents. You know, if there's a bad teacher, then parents need the opportunity to go to the administration and say, hey, this is what's happening, and and I, I need you to look at it. And then if the, if the um, principal says, oh, wow, that, that teacher's just not doing what we need them to do here uh, in Johnsonville or, uh, or Pamplico or even in Florence District 1, then then." That's what that adept system is there. That's why it's there to make sure that our teachers in our schools are are teaching our children and performing like they should, or that instruments there to to get rid of a teacher. Kathy, one of the great divides in American politics is urban rural. I think that's expressed, in a, and I think South Carolina, as much as anybody, represents that that divide. I grew up in a small town. Um, there were textile mills and lumber mills and all these other sorts of things. They were the funding mechanism mm-hmm. for the education system in that small town. It was adequately funded. Mm-hmm. It performed admirably. It educated young people. I mean, I'm probably the exception. It didn't get so educated <laughs> in public schools. But but in all honesty, we've seen an, a, a mass exodus of, of opportunity from rural America. And along with that, it's become complicated, difficult to fund rural school districts. Um, how should we make up the deficit for providing kids in small towns and in rural communities the sort of education that they are getting in Lexington, they are getting in Horry, they are getting in in Greenville counties. What would a superintendent of education, uh, what would your program look like in addressing uh, that? that, uh, It's a discrepancy. It is, Ken. And I've been in every school district in South Carolina. I have traveled to every one of them. And, And when I've testified before the General Assembly, I have said there are schools in South Carolina that my three children would not set foot in. But if they're not good enough for my children, then they're not good enough for any child in South Carolina, and we should be ashamed. So we have to do something that no matter where a child lives, they are getting a quality education in South Carolina. They're in a building that's safe. And so we need to make sure that that's happening. I know in the budget this year, there's more money for facilities for rural districts. That's important. We got to make sure those buildings are safe for our students. Um, we we need to make sure there's a quality teacher in every classroom in South Carolina, whether you're in rural South Carolina or you're in Ori in Charleston. We've got to make sure, and that's what we find a lot of times that our teachers, and because we're in a teacher shortage crisis, they're not always wanting to go to our rural districts. There's not housing there for many of them. I'm very excited about what Fairfield County is doing. They're doing a teacher village where they're building homes on land that they had next to the district office that'll be available for teachers. I mean, because there there was no place for them to live. And so that is something we got to make sure that we have housing. We got to make sure we have a quality teacher and we've got to make sure that those class sizes are smaller so that those students who often come to school behind others, they probably didn't have the preschool that my children had. We've got to make sure that we have smaller class sizes so that we can help them catch up and they need to receive the education that they deserve and every student deserves in the public schools of South Carolina. Is there too many, are there too many school districts in South Carolina? Well, I know that on the last couple of years, uh, we have consolidated some school districts, 
and uh, and that's important that communities come together for consolidation. So um, that has helped. There's been um, incentives put in for these school districts to consolidate. One thing we got to make sure is that more money is going to the classroom, to the classroom where it really, really matters. Um, some of these smaller school districts, they probably need to look at um, consolidating services like human resources, benefits people, um, school bus supervisors. Uh, so that is something that we can do to help save money in our districts and make sure that the money is being used appropriately in the classrooms where that where it but needs you, to go. Would you agree with this statement? The business model of consolidation appears to be more efficient than, than the way we are trying to educate kids in rural districts today. I mean, is, is that a, is that a, I don't want to say it's an accurate statement. Is it a fair statement to, to, to say we are going to be forced to consider further consolidation because education at the end of the day it has finite resources to which to allocate toward education. Right. And and you know as much as I know that South Carolina is a legislative state. Sure. And so that has to be done through the General Assembly. Um, and, and so next year, I look forward to seeing how these districts who are consolidating, because there's a good many that's come in the very um, early stages of consolidation. So I look forward to seeing how they're doing as they consolidate. And uh, and I think that more districts, but we have to have community buy-in, uh, that that more districts probably need to look at that because we need to do what's best for, for our students. But again, it needs to come with community buy-in. And a start to that is just a sharing of, of staff and resources. Last question, this segment. You've been accused on the campaign trail. The two things that I paid closest attention to on the negative side of the campaigning, uh, the accusation of one candidate's not qualified, and the other is you're in the wrong party. You're really a Democrat disguised as a Republican running in a Republican primary. Your response to that? Oh, that is such a lie. <laughs> I mean, that's the only thing I can say. And I hate negative campaigning. You know, if you've watched this, you've noticed that my campaign's just been up and above, and we're going to continue to do that. I am a member of Lexington Town Council, and I have been for the last 17 years. And if any of you out there know anything about the town of Lexington, you know that we are one of the most conservative towns in South Carolina. I would not be on this council for 17 years. Also, if you pull up my voting record, it shows strong Republican. So let me tell you where this is coming from. Last year, I was the president of the National League of Cities. Now, you know when you were on county council, you could have been a part of NACO, um, cities, towns, and villages across America belong to the National League of Cities. And so I was the first person from South Carolina to serve as the president of the National League of Cities. That's a big deal for the town of Lexington. That's a big deal for the state of South Carolina. In fact, the governor came when, when we had the reception honoring me and everything. So I'll always be known as the Zoom president of the National League of Cities because all of my meetings were on Zoom. So as the president of the National League of Cities, you introduce the vice president, no matter who it is. I was hoping it was going to be Pence. When I was second vice president and moving up from second vice to first vice to president, uh, it, it would have been Mike Pence. But unfortunately, we know that elections have consequences, and that did not happen. So I had to introduce our current vice president. And so I introduced her in a Zoom call, and she says, thank you, Councilwoman Manus, for that introduction. You're welcome. And then I had to introduce... Uh, the Speaker of the House. And whoever wrote her speech went a little further and said, thank you, Kathy Maness from Lexington, South Carolina, for your leadership. Yeah, I'm a leader. I'm the president of the National League of Cities, first person ever from South Carolina. And my opponent and the uh, dark money that's come into South Carolina, they took those snippets and use those snippets of thanking me for introducing them. Y'all, we live in the South. You know when people introduce you, you thank them for doing that. And that's all this was all about. And, uh, and took those snippets and said that I've been endorsed uh, by the Democrats. They don't know me. If you said to the vice president or the speaker of the House, do you know Kathy Maness? They'd go, no, nope, they have no idea. So that is just a flat out lie, dirty politics. I am so sick of that. I want to talk about the great things I can do for public education in South Carolina. 
And uh, and let's just quit this dirty politic. And we got about five more days. Let's make this a clean campaign. And we intend to do that tonight at seven o'clock in our um, broadcast of debate on uh, in our varying stations in the in the varying markets. Kathy Maynes, Republican nominee, Superintendent of Education. We'll take a break. Come back with one more segment uh, and a couple of more questions. Back in a minute. Welcome back. We're in the studio with Kathy Maynes, candidate, Republican candidate for the Office of Superintendent of Education. We'll have a debate tonight at 7 o'clock over these same airwaves. Uh, I never imagined, I would have to ask this question of a candidate for Superintendent of Education. I never imagined I'd talk to a Superintendent of Education uh, <laughs> candidate. Uh, but but anyway, this uh, the National Education Association, the um, uh, I guess the National, the Department of Education that a lot of Republicans are bothered by, some mm-hmm. of the pronouncements saying, I don't know some of the uh, some of the policies they pass down. Um, transgenderism mm-hmm. has been a big figure, a big uh, feature of of their agenda. Um, simple question: Should a person born as a biological male be allowed to compete against biological females under the premise or auspice that they have transitioned from one sex to another? No, my daughter um, played for Lexington High School, played soccer. That soccer team was like watching a ballet on the soccer field. They were wonderful. They went to the state cup. And as a parent, I would be outraged if uh, a person who was born a male took her place on the Lexington girls soccer team. So I, um, I, I do not think that that should happen. What about, and we need to do away with the U.S. Department of Education. Okay, there, there you go. What about the restrooms? I mean, I, I read some of the, uh, knowing you were coming on, and know I'm preparing for debate, um, the Department of Education says that biological males who identify as female should be allowed to use the female restroom. Um, is that something, are we at the mercy of the federal government, or, or can a superintendent of education working with the school district address that? I, I don't think we're at the mercy of the federal government when it comes to that. Um, you know, if we need to have, like, a, a single restroom for those students, then fine. But biological girls go in the girls' bathroom and biological boys go in the boys' bathroom. I'm almost embarrassed to ask that question, but that's a reality coming down from, from the federal government. Um, you've got about four minutes here, and, um, and I know you can um, – solicit support from our listeners in four minutes so i'll get out of the way we'll talk again tonight but i'll get out of the way appreciate you being here appreciate you answering our questions but um the floor is yours speak directly to the voters thank you ken thank you so much for having me here um listen i'm kathy manus and i had somebody tell me one time you always ask for the vote so listeners here i would be honored to have your vote on june 28th i want to empower our parents and our teachers and our administrators and not the bureaucrats We need to expand our faith-based community and get in there and work with our children as mentors. We can't go in there and talk about our love of Christ, but, oh, man, they can see the love of Christ on their face. And that is so important because so many of our children need mentors. So please, if you're listening and you have some time when school goes back, please go be a mentor. That is very important that we do that. I want to make sure our students are ready for the three E's, enrollment, enlistment, and employment. I'm a parent of three children. My oldest is gifted and talented. My youngest, we had a golf cart accident when he was five years old, and he has traumatic brain injury. So his whole life, he was spent, he was in special education. So as a parent, I dealt with what it was like to deal with with all my own children with different abilities, including the disability. And I fought hard for my son, just like I'll fight for every student in the schools of South Carolina. We need to be careful as Republicans that we elect a person on June 28th that meets the qualifications for this office because I don't want a judge to decide who could possibly be our next state superintendent of education. And I sure don't want this constitutional office to go to a Democrat. So on June 28th, I'm the only qualified candidate on the ballot, and I ask that you go and vote Kathy Manus because I am the right person at the right time with the right qualifications and experience to be our next state superintendent of education. So on June 28th, go vote Kathy Manus because I'm going to make the public schools of South Carolina better than they have ever been before. So thank you for having me here, and I look forward to tonight. Okay, thank you very much. Kathy Manus, Republican candidate in a runoff against uh, Ellen Weaver. The debate is tonight 
at seven o'clock. I'm excited about it. I actually get to play smart guy for for a night, and I hardly ever uh, get to do that. Thank you, Kathy. Appreciate mm-hmm. you being here. We'll take a break. We'll be back in just a minute.